this episode is about what does the quote fighting fascists even mean? I've been hearing that a lot lately after some of the riots that have taken place across the country or some of the intimidation tactics that have occurred um, by anti so-called Antifa and by BLM. I've heard some of these people say, even people who have been mixed up in, in homicides and murder, they've said, well, I had no choice because I was fighting fascists. So if conduct is justified under the auspices that this individual was engaged in some righteous act of fighting fascists or fighting Nazis or fighting fascism, it makes sense to, to conclude that, well, they just had no choice. But as that one guy in uh, The Princess Bride said, you keep using that word, but I do not think that you understand what it means. So what is fascism? Do these guys even know what fascism is? Benito Mussolini was the creator of fascism. He created the, let's see, I don't know if I can pronounce this, Fasci Italiani di Combattimento, the precursor to the fascist party in 1919 in Milan, Italy. And it was basically violent authoritarianism, but just with a new name, basically using squads of violent militant supporters they would beat and kill their fellow Italians until their fellow Italians complied with their political agenda. The word fascism comes from the Italian word fascio, which means bundle, i.e. a bundle of people. And that all came out of ancient Rome when leaders would carry a bundle of sticks with an axe. And if you look at the the symbol of the original fascist movement in Italy, it had a bundle of sticks with an accent. So that's where the term fascist comes from. And we're often told by the mo these modern leftist groups, these movements, Black Lives Matter and, and Antifa, that you're either with us or you're against us. And you've seen that and you've heard that. In other words, you cannot be neutral. This isn't a new idea. That's exactly what um, happened with the original version of fascism. And the whole point here is, is that these groups, ironically or not so ironically, and I'll explain why, they are engaging in fascist tactics. And I'll get to it, but the reason that they're engaging in fascist tactics is because, although maybe they're not, quote, fascists, Communism and fascism really are very close to the same thing, and they both use the same tactics, the same sorts of propaganda. So that's why the fascist tactics that you'll see are, are basically the same as the communist tactics that you'll see. And who was fighting? Who was the original anti-fascists? They weren't the only ones. But the original group, the anti-fascists that Antifa has named themselves after, well, they were the communists. The communists were fighting the fascists. Now, they weren't the only ones. Obviously, the United States came in there and defeated, for real, all of these fascists. fascists. But some of these rebel groups within these socialist uh, European countries, they had these uh, militant communist groups, in some case supported by the Soviet Union when it comes to the Spanish Civil War. And I'll, I'll get to that. Um, <clears throat> so 1919, fascism literally was created because Benito Mussolini created it. Now, who was M Mussolini? Mussolini was a journalist. He had a newspaper in Milan, Italy, and I don't know that I can pronounce it, Il Popola d'Italia. So he was a socialist. He was a socialist, member of the Socialist Party. He was a journalist. And he, he um, started his own newspaper where he advocated for militarism, 
for something called irredentism, which was a movement to un reunify parts of Italy that sort of like Hitler thought that uh, lots of uh, parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and, and uh, present day, um, you know, places that weren't, quote, Germany, he wanted to bring that back into what he saw Germany as, and as they called it, um, breathing space or living space. It was the same sort of thing in Italy. They believed that they were the, the, the uh, had inherited what was left of the Roman Empire and the Italian Renaissance, and they wanted to, to bring back together um, what was supposed to be Italy, just like Nazi Germany ended up doing, because they were copying Mussolini. So he was a socialist journalist who advocated for militarism and, and um, you know, bringing these territories back to so-called Italy. Um, so he started to disagree with the socialists at, with one major policy uh, difference. And so what was happening in 1919, that was World War I. So Mussolini was pro-war. He advocated war. He wanted to go to war to bring these areas of Italy back. And the socialists did not want war. Now, they, they agreed on 95, 99% of, of their policy issues. Domestic policy, they agreed completely. We're talking about the party's foreign policy. That's where the first fascist disagreed with the socialists. So he was a socialist. In fact, his newspaper, even after he started it, uh, had the word socialist displayed on its masthead until 1918. So Mussolini was very much a socialist. He created his own more violent pro-war offshoot of, of socialism. And he, and, uh, um, let's see. So he left to personally go fight in World War I. And that's when he formally had left the Socialist Party. And at that point, he and his followers, as they soon became called the fascists, declared the socialists to be the enemy of the state because of the anti-war policies. But other than the foreign policy issue of war, they pretty much agreed on everything. Their policies were substantially the same. And this formed the prototype later for Hitler's uh, vision of the Third Reich. So it, it, it was Hitler that copied Mussolini. Mussolini was around a long time before Hitler, 11 years before Hitler. And Mussolini had worked everything out by the time Hitler came to power. Initially, Hitler was seen as a total loser. Um, no one wanted to buy his book, Mein Kampf. No one was interested in him. Then the Great Depression came, and he boomed. Um, fascism would become a very important part of Nazism. But Hitler, from the beginning, wanted to adopt and then adapt what he saw Mussolini create. Hitler was a big fan of Mussolini. He was at one point trying to um, get his autograph. He was writing him. He was trying to meet him. So fascists were basically socialists who wanted to go to war. The Nazis modeled themselves after these original fascists. So then the question begs, were the, the, were the fascists also communists? And looking back at the creation of fascism, I lost my place here. Um, looking back at the creation of fascism, what had just occurred? You had World War I, and then you had the Russian Revolution, which occurred. And like the Socialist Party, the Communist Party really didn't have a whole lot of domestic policy differences with the fascists, with the Nazis. What was the big difference? Well, again, it had to do with foreign policy. So they didn't differ so much on, on domestic policies. And what you'll see is where they really differed was in the external 
power the way that they would spread their power. So communism was intended to be a worldwide virus that spreads beyond borders, a global, a global movement. Whereas fascism, as first created, was all about Italy and reclaiming the the Italy uh, that was inherited from the Roman Empire. And fascism in Nazi Germany was all about the specific geography of reclaiming or recreating uh, the Third Reich. They weren't about global movements to, to spread, whereas communism was the ultimate virus that was just meant to take over the entire world. So, you know, two dictators may see eye to eye on 99 issues out of 100, but when, when the 100th issue is, well, who's going to be dictator in this specific geography, obviously they're going to disagree there. So the main way that the fascists got to power was killing off and intimidating what at the time was the, lar the world's largest and most popular party, and that was in Europe, the Socialist Party. And basically the way they did it is these squadrists or terrorists would descend upon the, these towns in trucks, uniformed and in black shirts. They would have knives. They killed thousands of people. Um, from 1919 um, to 1922, they were really doing a lot of this. I mean, not just intimidating and terrorizing people, but killing people. The killing went on and got worse until Mussolini became prime minister of Italy. So these are all authoritarian regimes, and they all maintain power by force and by suppressing opposing ideas and by suppressing enemies, even if they are similar enemies. Both communism and fascism glorify this autocratic, highly centralized and all-powerful government. They both, as a central component, suppress the individual. They suppress individualism. In both communism and in socialism, the individual is meaningless. It's not even a concept. Not um, both in daily life and especially in government. So there, there are differences between communism and socialism, but that's the central point, is that it's all about the state, the government. Now, in communism, they call it the party or the people, but really, I mean, we can look at the history as it's turned out. It never, it never was practiced the way they said that they practiced it. Okay, communism has always been about a dictatorship. They can say that the people were in charge. In practice, that never happened. It was always a dictatorship. So while they differed in what they called themselves, basically both were dictatorships where there was no religion, in fact, suppression of religion, and there's no such thing as the individual. It's all about the government, the state, the party. So in, in their main tenets, they're very close to identical. Now that doesn't mean that they're going to get along. That doesn't mean that they're not going to, you know, fight each other to the last man. Um, whereas communism, the idea is that the government owns all of the means of production and all of the private property. And the government then decides, you know, who gets what, who deserves what. And they try to say that the people are all equal. Whereas in fascism, they're doing the same exact thing, except in fascism, they're allowing some nominal ownership rights of private property, where they, they tell you that, that you own something, but they can take it away if they want to at any time. And that's a lot like um, communist China today, where the Communist Party runs it and they're in charge, and they can allow you to have a business to run a business, but they can take it away at any time. And, you know, that you know, almost looks more like fascism than it does communism, but that's how communism has, has um, 
been able to survive is it's sort of switched to fascism. So you have this this blending of 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 these these political philosophies by the time you get to 2020, where it's not even clear who's a communist and who's a fascist in the world when you're talking about China. Um, religion. So both communism and fascism have to abolish the concept of religion. The central government, the party, the state, that is your, that is your religion. That's your new religion. And um, you'll see that anywhere that, that these movements have, have become important, they have suppressed religion. So at their core, both fascism and communism are basically political viruses that are meant to spread and to take over new territory. Again, communism was meant to spread everywhere, whereas it, Italian fascism um, sought to spread within particular geography. So why were the Italian fascists, Mussolini, and the German fascists, the Nazis, why were they political allies? Because they were claiming separate pieces of ground. It, they were natural allies. And why did they dislike the communist? Well, the communists wanted everything, including their ground. So it didn't matter what they agreed on with domestic policy or political philosophy, which were very close. All that mattered was is the power struggle. And that's what always matters. That's what always matters um, with, with third world governments, with um, autocratic regimes, really with any government. And you can look at the history books when the Russian Revolution first took place. Uh, Benito Mussolini had praised Lenin and, and his Bolsheviks. And he publicly referred to himself in 1919 as the, quote, Lenin of Italy. So it wasn't until they started to gain power and move outside the boundaries of the Soviet Union, of Russia, heading towards his direction, that he became an enemy of, of the con communists. Other than that, they were pretty close. Let's see. So as far as what's been going on today, let me see if I can do this properly. So you have this sort of stuff going on in the country. And this is one of the recent incidents where the leftist group, I believe this is a Black Lives Matter group, they went to a restaurant in Rochester, New York, and basically were harassing and intimidating people, winning over the hearts and minds. And it, you can look directly back at history and see that all of this has played out before. It's all written right there in the playbook of the original fascists from Italy. The same playbook that the Nazis used in Germany. But it wasn't just them that used it because, again, they were very close in, in the way, in, in their philosophies. It's the same thing that the communists did. So that's why the modern tactics look a lot, a lot like the fascist tactics is because they're, they're just, they're the same thing two strains of, of the same different thing. All right, so that's what's happening in the... That's what's happening in the... Uh, in the world right now. And if we look back, you know, what did the actual, the literal fascists, because these guys that do this stuff, the rioters, they say it's justified because we're fighting fascists. Well, let's look at the fascists. I mean, literally, the fa fascism was created by Mussolini. So how, what tactics did he use when he came to power? So he had this group of guys called the Black Shirts. I have some pictures of them. There they are. So that's a group of Mussolini's Black Shirts. They obviously wore black shirts, but they were basically a gang, an armed gang. 
Um, they had firearms, they had clubs. That guy's got a cane right there in the middle and they beat the enemies into suppression. So they would kill you or beat you or intimidate you until you got out of their way or join them. And in fact, you couldn't just get out of their way. You were either, either with us or against us, but they were the paramilitary wing of the Italian fascist party known as the squadrissimo. And they were based on some of the essentially Italian special forces out of, out of world war one. Um, and Mussolini had, had kind of courted them and got and obtained their support very early on. And then he used them and created this paramilitary wing for his political party. And you'll see that Hitler later did the very same thing, but instead of calling them the black shirts, he called them the brown shirts. And this is basically what you, this is like what you're seeing if a Republican or a conservative speaker wants to go talk at a college or university in 2020 America. These useful idiots show up and they shout them down. They threaten them. They make it so they can't even go there. And that's exactly what these black shirts would do is if you tried to speak up against them, they would shout you down. They'd intimidate you. They'd, they'd threaten you. And that's how they furthered their political goals. It wasn't through the exchange of ideas and through debate. It was through violence. It was through riots. It was through murder. It was through assault and battery. And it started off small, smallish, and got worse and worse and worse, the more powerful that Mussolini got. And again, Hitler later copied that, um, that plan. And that's where his brown shirts came from, who became the Nazi stormtroopers. So they had mobilized tens of thousands um, of, of these black shirts and carried out acts of brutal violence against their own people. Here's another picture of them on the march. And it was justified because their leader, Benito Mussolini, he said, basically, these are these are like assaults on an Austrian trench. And that, that's one of his quotes. So you, you can go beat up your fellow countrymen. You can kill them and don't feel bad about it because you're, in theory, in your philosophy, you're assaulting an Austrian trench in the middle of World War I. You're not hurting an innocent person. You're killing the enemy. And isn't that kind of like the rhetoric that we're hearing today? That, you know, that's not a human being. That's, that's a fascist. We're killing fascists. We're attacking fascists. So, ironically, the people calling everyone else fascists, and we'll get to whether or not these other people... Um, could possibly be fascist, but they're the ones that are using these same tactics that the literal real fascists were using in the past. So what else did the fascists do? Well, history tells us they interrupted meetings, they beat elected officials, they made it impossible for local governments to work, they intimidated, they threatened, they even beaded beat their uh, political opponents who were the socialists, even though they agreed on most things, but power is power. It's like business is business. They beat them into submission and then they would, they would do it in one town or one jurisdiction and then they'd replicate it somewhere else. And they spread from the cities to the small towns, to the more rural areas. And then they got worse and worse. The fascist squads practiced these localized, highly personal attacks on specific leaders, on specific labor leaders, on specific political leaders in, in a town. They would try to basically decapitate their organizations by going after the leaders. And aren't we seeing that here today where Republican or conservative political leaders 
are chased in the restaurants. We had we had one of those situations happen fairly close to where I am, where the president's press secretary was chased out of a restaurant. But you're having very similar situations, though, uh, camped out in politicians' yards, attacking them on the street, even when they leave the White House. The playbook really isn't all that different. It just hasn't gotten as violent and as deadly as the real fascists did it. Not yet. But again, in history shows that they ramp it up as they gain power through their figureheads. They ramp up and increase the, the, the violence. They increase the level of damage that they inflict. And the original victims of that, ironically, were the socialists. And again, they didn't disagree on domestic policy all that much. But power was power. And so they had this terror campaign against these socialist leaders. They'd come late at night. They'd travel from surrounding towns. They'd surround your home. They'd invite you out to talk. If you refused, they'd forcibly come in. They'd threaten to harm your family. They'd light the house on fire. They would practice ritual humilia humiliation of their en enemies. They would force their opponents to drink castor oil. They'd inflict all sorts of brutal humiliation on them. And then after that, they'd tackle the symbolic part of it, where they'd take the flags down. They'd take down the socialist red flag, and they would stomp on it. They'd burn it. And does that sound familiar? Sometimes the fascists would drive the prominent um, opposing party leaders around, strip them naked, drag them through, through uh, public handcuff them to posts along major roads. And although some of the opposition leaders could have lived through this, could have dealt with it, what's the one thing that they most people aren't willing to put up with? And that's a threat to their families. When the fascists start coming to their homes and threatening their, their, their spouses, their children, that's at the point at which they break. And that's exactly what the fascists did in Italy. Is they took it against the families. And again, where are we seeing that? We're seeing it all over the United States now. I've even seen where people have made, you know, politically unpopular statements on Facebook. And they get run out of town, out of their job. They have to run and hide, but that's not good enough for a lot of the mobs. They'll go after families. They'll find out who the mother, the father is, the grandmother. They'll go send somebody to, to park in their driveway and stare at them. They'll practice all sorts of intimidation tactics on family members. And it's all about bending them, bending you to, the, to their will. So their goal is nothing short but to destroy their opposition. That's fascism. And ironically, a lot of the early fascists in Italy, they were the intellectual class in the country. They weren't really the, the workers, the laborers. They were the army officers, the, 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 work, the, uh, the ownership class, the middle class. So burning, stomping on flags, destroying national and cultural and, and historic symbols, it's all a performance cleverly designed to have an effect on the minds of the people who might otherwise be neutral. But remember, you're either with them or you're against them. And they don't stop. They will not stop. You allow them to do one thing, they just move on to the next step. It never ends. It does end eventually. But it won't end where you think it will end. So once they conquer you, and once they would pacify the resistance, they, they take it up to the next level. 
They uh, take over all of the political and the symbolic uh, public spaces. They, the fascists tore down the flags, the busts of Marx, the socialist slogans, replaced them with the Italian flag, busts of the king. Um, they had marches, parades, p political ceremonies. Um, it, would, it was all about the perception that the fascists now dominate these public spaces that were recently occupied by the enemy. So it was a performance intended to dominate and intimidate real and imagined and uh, political enemies while also fostering this cohesion and feeling of solidarity among, among each other. Um, sort of like wearing a face mask at this point has become um, more about solidarity with the cause than it's about safety that it was all a show for the cause. So th through illegal violence rather than through elections, through intimidation rather than through ideas, that was how the fascists took power. And the violence would never stop. In fact, it would get worse and worse and worse. It doesn't go the other direction. Um, they raided homes of nationally prominent politicians, which we're starting to see in this country, uh, the, including the former prime minister of Italy. Um, they, they would, uh, excuse me, physically seize control of, of the communications in the country. And, you know, by suppressing the opposition and replacing the opposition with their own people, um, it brought very quickly that country to a dictatorship. So what is the so-called Antifa and how does it relate to fighting fascism? Because the modern day so-called Antifa claims to be the same group that was fighting against the fascists back in 1930s Italy. So they basically the modern Antifa appropriated the name Antifa and a version of their symbol from this group that was created in 1932 called the Antifa Shitshe Action. So I can't pronounce it correctly, but it was formed in the Weimar Republic, 1932. And who formed it? It was members of the Communist Party in Germany. So Antifa, even the original Antifa, who were fighting against real, literal fascists, was formed by communists. But they were fighting actual fascists in 1930s Europe. And um, here's, a, here's a, a big part of it. And going back to the belief that they're fighting fascists, you know, it's justified to kill somebody because we're fighting a fascist. We're fighting fascists. We have no choice. Well, you have to understand that they didn't, they don't necessarily, or they didn't even originally necessarily mean literal fascists because communists have always had a little problem with the truth. It wasn't used, the word fascist wasn't used just to describe actual literal fascists. It was used to describe capitalist society in general. And virtually any Soviet, um, excuse me, virtually any anti-Soviet or anti-Stalinist group activity or opinion. So the term anti-fascist became um, commonly used in the Soviet Union and the Communist Party, where it became synonymous with the party line. So anybody not towing the party line of the Communist Party was a fascist. And isn't that exactly what we're seeing here today is who gets called a fascist? Well, anybody wearing a red hat, you're either with us or you're against us. So anybody not with us and we're towing the party line is a fascist. And that is the Communist Party tradition from the very beginning. So it's not about fighting against fascists as you or I think a fascist is. 
it's sort of an inside understanding of communists that anybody who's not with us is a fascist. And so that's why we hear them calling somebody who's just a Trump supporter and a red hat a fascist doesn't make sense to us other than maybe they're, they're an idiot or they're crazy. But actually, it does make sense to them because they've been indoctrinated with the party line. And anyone wearing the red hat's not towing the party line. And like the symbols, the red flags that were stomped and burned and toppled in 1930s Italy, um, you or even in 1920s Italy, the red hats must be toppled. They must be destroyed. What else? The American flag is a symbol of capitalism that is not with the party line and must be destroyed, must be burned, must be stopped on, must be um, used in such a way as to intimidate the opposition, intimidate the enemy. So you have to watch what they're doing in a lot of these cities around America in that context. When they say that they're fighting fascism, they're fighting capitalism is what they're doing. And part of that is toppling your statues. They won't stop. You allow Confederate statues to be toppled. They're going to continue. They won't stop. They're going to continue with the Thomas Jefferson statues and they're going to continue until they, they topple the Washington Monument. Even if you let them topple the Washington Monument, they wouldn't stop. They'd want to burn the White House. I mean, there is no stopping. There's only one direction. And that is from the playbook created by Benito and Mussolini. Um, that is exactly what was adopted by Hitler. That's exactly what um, Lenin and Stalin did. So what's the end game? So where is all this going? What do they want? What does Antifa, BLM, the communists, what do they want? So just as history tells us what fascism is, it can tell, tell us where fascism goes. Um, how did they maintain their power? How did they create their power? Where will they take us if we allow them? The perhaps the best illustration of where fascists and communists will take us is the Spanish Civil War. So the Spanish Civil War was this culmination of the real fascists in 1930s Europe competing with the real communists of 1930s Europe, as well as the communists um, led by the Soviet Union and created this civil war of epic proportions in Spain. And it illustrated the end game of where these so-called anti-fascists want to bring things. This is where they will go if they're sufficiently supplied and supported. The, this war in Spain lasted from 1936 to 1939. An unknown number of people died during that period, anywhere from half a million people to a million people. We don't even know. Um, let me show you a map here. This is the official map, even today, from the government of Spain, I believe, of where they found all the graves so far of missing people killed in the Spanish Civil War. They're still finding these mass graves, and they have a color chart. So nobody even knows where, where people ended up where they're buried, how they died. Um, they're finding mass graves. That's one of them all the time in Spain. But this is where things end up when the fascists get their way. So leading up to the Spanish Civil War, it looks a lot like what we're seeing today in, in the United States. Um, Spanish commentators were talking about chaos and preparation for revolution and, um, and this new interest in fascism. But you had these massive, sometimes violent, destructive protests. And they were basically people striking 
but you you had very much of, of like what we have today with with political leaders encouraging these these violent destructive to physical property um, strikes of workers on a large scale. You had the manipulation and politicization of the justice system. And aren't we seeing that today? You had a substantial growth in political violence. Aren't we seeing that today? You had a severe polarization before this civil war that was so intense that it was a routine um, occurrence for a clash between the left and the right, or the so-called left and, and right. Because really, when we're talking about fascist versus communist, really, it's it's left versus other left. I would argue that, that, that there's anything right, as we would call it today, with the term right, about fascism that has no no concept of religion, no concept of individuality, no concept of inalienable natural rights or free men whatsoever. It really has nothing to do with uh, what we would call a right wing or right today in political terms. The only thing in common would be nationalism or love of country. That's really the only thing. Other than that, really, it's all communism or socialism. You have a, a aggressive militaristic socialism, or you have a a um, less overtly militaristic um, socialism, and and it's really left versus left. But in the lead up to the Spanish Civil War, the government was allowing one side of this to commit these acts of violence and to destroy property and get away with it. Well. If they would be executed. And where else has, has that been happening? That's exactly what what has happened now with uh, with the Rittenhouse shootings in Wisconsin. We had a felon who wasn't supposed to have a gun who attacked a 17-year-old kid with a gun, and he's not prosecuted for anything, not even being a felon in possession of a firearm. And then you have the kid that was attacked with a firearm by a felon and and by a sex offender, at least one of them, if that wasn't the same one, and nobody else is prosecuted but the kid. Why? Because the prosecutors are, are putting politics over justice. And that's exactly what was happening in pre-Civil War Spain, is that there were acts of violence on both sides, but only one side would get prosecuted. And what was the outcome of that? We'll see. So one party was more likely to be prosecuted for doing the same exact act as the other party. And then you had these so-called social crimes. And again, where, where are we hearing this? Social justice. Well, social crimes, where it's where the workers, the worker class, was they were demanding less work and more pay. They were refusing to pay rent pay for goods, and, and violence by them was becoming increasingly common because it was due to them. It was a, there, there were social crimes. And where are we hearing that with, with reparations and that, that, that violence isn't violence if it's just destroying property because property can be replaced or that we deserve to, to loot a target because uh, slavery existed in the past? Now, to certain people, they, they may have been duped into this, but don't fool yourself that it's right out of the playbooks of both communism and fascism. So what was happening in, in pre-Spanish Civil War of Spain is very much like what's happening now. And... It, the outcome was you know, one of the bloodiest civil wars in the history of the world. And look what the fascists go after. And when we see them in action, which we can when we look back at history, for instance, we have this church. All right, so religion is bad to 
the anti-fascists, the original anti-fascists. Look what they did to this beautiful church in Spain. That's the outcome. Here's another famous picture. Here's all the anti-fascists, the original Antifa, murdering Jesus, executing Jesus. So they're, they're shooting the statue of Jesus in Spain. Um, let's see, where's another one? Here's all um, in, in this little town in Spain. Here are the women begging the, the um, communist, anti-fascist, not to kill all the men that they had captured, all their husbands. So that's where we end up with, with um, allowing the communists, the so-called anti-fascists, to have their way. The intimidation continues, the violence continues, and it ramps up more and more and more until you have a Spanish Civil War and you have mass graves all over the place. Now imagine all the mass graves that there would be across the United States, much larger people. Uh, much larger country with a lot more population. That is the end game. That's the only end game there is with Antifa. And while they may pretend that they're for something other than they're not, all they are for is destroying their enemies. And that is anyone who's not towing the party line. That's basically anyone that is not a communist. And ironically, it's the same exact tactics that the fascists use, the real literal fascists. And whether they realize it or not, they're doing the same things. They're suppressing the free exchange of ideas. They're suppressing debate through violence, through intimidation. They're doing the same thing that the black shirts did in Italy. And they're doing the same thing that the brown shirts did in, in Nazi Germany. So in America, in 2020, we don't need a militant group of so-called anti-fascists to defeat our current um, uh, fascist dictator, because we don't have a fascist dictator. Again, um, the people that they're attacking bear no logical relation to what they, what a fascist is. Okay. While they may have a love of country, they, they meet absolutely none of the other requirements to be a fascist. They don't believe in the state controlling private business, private property. They don't believe in uh, an individual not being a concept. To the contrary, most of the people that they're calling um, fascists are proponents of individual liberty and freedom and are not racist at all. So the fascists, yes, they, they were racist in many ways. Um, but the people that they're attacking, there's, there's really no proof so far that I've seen at all that, that race has anything to do with it. I mean, they're attacking the police. Well, in a lot of these cities, like Atlanta, over half the police department is black. Well, are they racist or what? No, they were literally racist in Italy. They were literally racist in Nazi Germany. But that's not a requirement of fascism. That's just a, a byproduct of it. Actually, in 2020 America, where we have freedom that they did not have in Italy, that they did not have in Germany, they didn't have a Bill of Rights. They didn't have a First Amendment. They didn't have a, a writ of habeas corpus. They didn't have any civil rights in these European countries. That's why our founders created us as a free people, as a free nation with natural and inalienable rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But we have the ability to challenge the deprivation of civil rights in America. In fact, that's what I do for a living is file Section 1983 cases where if, if a government employee acting under color of law 
violates any federal right that you have, and there's a lot of them, we can sue them. We can put it in front of a federal judge and we can get a court order stating that they deprived your civil rights and a payment of money damages and including attorney's fees and expenses. And to top it off, if, if they violate your civil rights, that's also a crime. It's also a federal felony. So there's a lot of uh, protection just in that. Now let's talk about system, systematic racism or systematic inequalities. Well, we have something called Monell claims, and that is a version of a Section 1983 federal lawsuit where if you have evidence that there's some city or county somewhere and they're racist and they do something bad to black or brown people as a policy, if you have any evidence of that whatsoever, oh man, we, we could file a great lawsuit and that's called a Monell claim, an official policy practice or procedure of any civil rights violation, especially racism or bias versus race, sex, um, gender. Uh, it can be sexual orientation now. So if there's evidence of any systematic discrimination, I mean, boom, there's a great lawsuit. Great lawsuit. They didn't have that in Italy. They didn't have that in Spain. So the, there, we've put the mechanisms in place to protect all American people of every ethnicity, every skin color. And they could do something about it if they wanted to. If, Of course, civil rights problems are always going to happen. Individual wrongs are always going to happen because uh, people are human and no human is, is perfect. So there are always going to be problems, but we've put um, mechanisms in place to deal with those problems. Um, that's not something that was available in 1930s Europe. And if we allow this to continue, it's going to spiral out of control. And in the words of Fred Thompson, um, this business is going to get out of control. And wait, what do you say? And we'll be lucky if we live through it, basically, is, is what he said. Um, remember to um, follow the Freedom is Scary Facebook page and join the the private group if you want to help join the fight. Um, there's lots of comments. Let me look at them here. I hope there's not a big tech collaborative list of wrong thinkers out there of people for the anti-fascists to prey on. And that was Doug, Doug Lilly. Um, yeah, I, well, you know that you know that there is, right? So the big tech companies are already basically any, they're not just censoring, but they're, they're so-called fact checking and making it look like they're making it look like you're spreading false information when they put these fact check little thingamabobs on your post. And that's almost like worse than just deleting your post because they're, oh, I don't know. It's just slimy. But yeah, I bet you there is. I bet you there is a list. I mean, we've always known how the government has lists. They make lists. That's what government does. But now big tech has become almost more powerful than the government. You know, they have to have lists. Oh, Barry Goldwater. Um, yet a man gets caught with a joint and gets his butthole searched in jail 30 days in a row. Yeah, that did that happen to you, Barry? <laughs> um, yeah, systemic. Um, true, Barry, that's what needs to be fixed, not replace it with fascism and communism. But yeah, admit, I've, I think you said many Americans cannot correctly identify fascism or communism. And that's kind of what I'm trying to make this video about is it, although it's not just right versus left, really it's, it's left versus left because communism really is very close to the same thing as socialism. And, um, you know, I believe the, the Soviet Union had the word socialist in, in their name. And the Nazis had the word socialist in their name. And the Italian socialist, like I said, uh, Mussolini had the word socialist on the top of his newspaper. So they're all socialists. 
They just can't agree on who divvies up the spoils. Yeah. All right, Barry, that's a good point. We're supposed to have a Bill of Rights, but we all know it hasn't been respected for at least 30 years. That's exactly right. And I would even take it further back than that. Really, since the Civil War, the courts have given us you know, wh whatever rights they think we ought to have. And, th that, and that's what we get. And it, it's, it really is just, just the way it is. And it, it's unfortunate. And I, hope, I wish more courts would start interpreting the Constitution as it was written. Let's see. Basically, what you're seeing is people pushing the shit out of the way because it's in the way of freedom. Let's see. Constitution says if enough people don't like their city government and their way of freedom, they can physically bring it down. That's why you see what's happening these days. All right. Well, you know, I, I don't know that there's anything in the Constitution that allows people to destroy, you know, physical property and commit violence against other people. I mean, I don't. I don't think that's it, it, it all authorized by the Constitution. What about Bolshevik or Sandinista parallels? San, uh, Sandinista and BLM seem like carbon copies. Well, really, all these things have have uh, been following the same uh, same playbook. All right, what do you think of the police enforcing the? Fascist mayors and governors, they don't hesitate to arrest people who don't wear a mask now. Well, I think they're separate issues, but somewhere along the way, we decided to create this police state that we're currently in. And we have over 5,000 federal laws and then sometimes thousands of laws in each particular state. And we have these huge uh, government police forces at this point. And I think I think it's absolutely unconstitutional. And obviously, I mean, I've I sued the governor here in West Virginia to try to stop him. And who is the government ever going to use to enforce any of this stuff? I mean, the politicians aren't going to go out and do it themselves. They're going to use the police. And if and if one police officer won't do it, the next one will. So there's there's always going to be um, there's always going to be someone to serve that role of useful idiot of the government's thug so i mean yeah what i think of it i, I think it's despicable but at the, at the very least it the, i do see some good things that came out of it um, for instance um, i think that the second amendment debate is over people know now why the second amendment exists and, and what the the value is is to their own personal safety and their family's safety to exercise their second amendment rights. I think that a lot of these governors have been exposed as the tyrants that they are, including our governor here in West Virginia. And I think a lot of them are just drunk with power. And then you have other governors like Christy Nome in South Dakota, who've really done a wonderful job. And it just, it's like the, probably said this before, but it, it Reminds me of that scene in Braveheart where, where Mel Gibson looks at, at Robert Bruce and says, you know, the people will follow you if you'll just lead them. You know, our governor here in West Virginia could have been a, a shining example of, of how you can protect freedom and liberty and also do your job to, to guide the public and protect the public like happened in South Dakota, but no, no, he chose the role of appointing a leftist liberal czar to rule over us. So like you said, hillbilly freedom is the only answer should have been shut down five to six months ago. That's right. 
the left's action is to, quote, accuse the other side of that which you are guilty, often attributed to the Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels. I believe, I believe he probably wasn't the first to say that. And I'm not sure if I'm recalling Sun Tzu having said that or or maybe one of the, the Roman emperors. But yeah, I think that saying's been around a long time, at least the idea. And that's exactly what they're doing is but, you know, whatever they're accusing others of doing, you better be sure they're doing the same thing or they're the ones doing it. You know, just like the Nazis burnt down the, uh, the Reichstag and used that to gain power. Well, hell, they're the ones that burnt the place down to begin with. Let's see, digging of the grave began in 1830 when our education system turned to Joseph's story to teach generations of uh, the errors of federal supremacy. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about 1830, but, but uh, you can find a lot of parallels with the public education system and the indoctrination used by the communist and by the fascist. In fact, I was looking at some of the, the propaganda drawings earlier and and uh, some are pretty interesting, and a lot of them in, involving children. Yeah, Hazel, good point. No one notice. No one's pushing gun control anymore, right? That's why I said gun, gun control, as far as the public is concerned, is dead. Now that doesn't mean that the Democrat Party has has forgotten about it. I mean, they're coming for gun control, but now. They're keeping quiet about it, and they want to get in power first. Barry, why isn't conspiracy covered under the First Amendment? So you're, you're, all right. That's a good question. So why, why, why can't you espouse a conspiracy to topple the government and have that speech be protected under the First Amendment? Well, that is a good question. You know, the courts have always ruled as, ruled as we've heard many times before that that the First Amendment does have limitations, i.e. you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Um, you know, conspiracy conspiracy was always a crime from the very beginning. It was one of those original I think was it 19 or 20 different federal crimes that that we had from day one from like 1790 from I think it was the Crimes Act of 1790. So treason, treason or uh, um, was always a crime that was that that was punishable. So you know, if I think if a conspiracy to commit treason is always going to be punishable and not protected under the First Amendment. And I think that's still a good question because, you know, one man's, one man's uh, freedom of speech and political, political dialogue, uh, um, one man's political speech is another man's criminal conspiracy. So that, that's a good question, but that, that's also the reason why our founding fathers wanted us to have the right to indictment by a grand jury and trial, trial by a jury of our peers because there's always going to be gray areas and there's no perfect way of doing things. Uh, Anthony, uh, Jim is a Democrat elected. So to believe otherwise requires proof by action. Nothing referring to Jim justice, nothing Jim has done proves contrary to that fact, regardless of his declaration as a Republican, his actions prove otherwise. Yeah. And it, it kind of goes with the discussion tonight of, of, of calling yourself anti-fascist, well, that's really a red herring because what you really are is pro-communist. So you're you're rioting, looting, um, intimidating, beating people, killing people under the so-called cause of fighting fascist, while in reality you're taking the prescribed steps in the communist playbook. And that's exactly what's happening. The other candidate wants to take our firearms away. 
I wouldn't vote for either Biden or Trump. That would... All right, I'm not sure what you're saying there. But speaking of candidates, remember that here in West Virginia, there is an option other than bad and worse, and that is to write in S. Marshall Wilson, uh, who's running for governor of West Virginia. They didn't let him on the ballot, but there's going to be a lot of people writing him in. And that is the option of freedom. He could be the Christy Nome of West Virginia, and we deserve to have somebody like that. And hopefully I'm going to see him tomorrow, but write in S. Marshall Wilson in the West Virginia gubernatorial race. That's my recommendation. Um, let's see, anything else? So that's basically it. Check out the Freedom of Scar is Scary Facebook page. Again, join the, the private group and make sure you point out to people that when these so-called anti-fascists anti um, engage in these behaviors, that you educate them to the fact that they are following the literal fascist playbook. And unlike 1930s Europe, there are no real literal fascists that they're fighting against. Trump supporters or whomever, I mean, basically just elderly um, people sitting in a restaurant are not fascists. They're not fascists at all. They're quite the opposite. Um, we are a country that that likes um, to go to church, religion, individual freedom. We're very much different from 1930s European um, European fascists. There's really almost almost literally nothing in common. So they're not fighting fascists. There there are no fascists on their on their battlefield. They're in reality promoting communism, seeking to overthrow our way of life, our history, our culture, our country, our flag. That's exactly what they're doing. Um, one last question here. Um, Anthony, so I've asked Marshall Wilson, how does a, quote, individual make a difference? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I, I think it happens at times. But I don't think anybody but God can can tell you how and when that that's going to happen. But certainly it does happen, especially now where everything is caught on video. At some point, there's you know a special moment to, that's captured. Something happens. For instance, what happened with Kyle Rittenhouse? And I, I think that we haven't heard the last of that. That that is going to be a big. Um, event in our history because it's not because of what happened mattered all that much with, with those idiots getting shot or with this kid getting mixed up in the middle of it. But the larger battle that's looming between the modern day left and the modern day right, which is nothing like the left and right of the Spanish Civil War, which was left and left. But we we also have this polarization. We have this situation of prosecutors only prosecuting one side. We have this situation of so-called social crimes having been committed where there's going to be reparations and, and uh, we have this increased promotion of tribalism. Um, an increased racial separat separatism movement, and it, it goes nowhere good. It's going to head directly for something like you had in the Spanish Civil War. And that is an awful outcome for us. So, again, thanks for watching, and I will, um, um, I'll try to, I'm, I want to try to pick like one night of the week or something where I, where I, I pick a topic and do the, you know, freedom is a scary discussion. I'm also going to put up as a podcast as well, because some people won't watch YouTube video for that long. Um, so, so check out the description of the video event. At some point I'll put a link to the podcast, but until next time, um, 
you know, remember, uh, freedom is scary and stay safe out there.